Hello and welcome to the Arsenal Way podcast, joining you every single week uh, to talk about the club that we cover, which is of course the Gunners. And uh, this week, sorry for the slight delay uh, in producing this week's episode, we hope to bring you these every single Monday, but sometimes things get in the way and scheduling reasons mean we can't. And so we're here today on Wednesday to bring you our thoughts from the weekend and look ahead, of course, the next game with all the latest Arsenal news that has come from the fallout of the weekend as well. As always, I'm joined by London's Chief Arsenal Reporter, Kaya Kainak. How are you doing, mate? You good, Joel? Very good, thank you, Tom. How about yourself? Not bad, mate. Not bad to bask in a 6-0 victory at all, um, of which we were both at the London Stadium to enjoy. And uh, yeah, it was quite the spectacle in Arsenal's 8,000th league win and biggest away league victory as well. So yeah, tell me what you made of it. Lots of very good stats coming from the game. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that. Uh, I think 8,000th goal from Trossard as well. Um 50 goals now for Saka, or 51. The youngest player to do that since mm. Frank Stapleton. So the youngest yeah. player in the Premier League era, if you like. I know some of some viewers get quite uh, quite upset if you if you tell them football started before 1992. But uh, yeah, that's uh, that's a great. It was a great day for Arsenal. I, I think, given that many people went in there, I, I don't know about you, but in the when I saw the team news, when we saw the benches and all that kind of stuff, it, it felt like potentially this could be a banana skin for Arsenal. And, and it's easy to think now that they beat us, that they beat West Ham 6-0, that it was always meant to be. But this is a team they hadn't beaten in three. It's a team they struggled against a lot this season. They were really poor in the in the game of the Carabao Cup. They were poor in the game of the Emirates. And finally, they turned up. Admittedly, you know, West Ham being awful was a big part of that. But Arsenal had to, to put them to the sword. And I think it was a really, really good performance Um the weirdest thing was, I don't even think it was Arsenal's best performance of the season. I think, you know, there's, there's there were things that Mikel Arteta will look at and think, yeah, we can get better at that. So positives mm. really all around for Arsenal. Um, very difficult to, to think of any negatives from, from a really good afternoon in East London. Yeah, yeah, eight thousandth goal win would be quite an incredible number of wins. Uh, <laughs> that would be ridiculous. Um, but yeah, eight thousandth uh, goal with yeah, Andrew Trossard scoring that fantastic finish as well on his right foot, curling into the top right hand corner um, as well, which has become, I think, a little bit of a, a trademark, if you like, of his type of finishing. He does love that finessed effort, uh, and he's he's really on a bit of a run. Of course, scored last week against Liverpool and has now scored against West Ham, and yet. His, his position in the team is an interesting one because whilst Havertz, of course, started that game up top against Liverpool, we were discussing in the press lounge beforehand what we kind of made of the lineup, and we were kind of discussing where we might see different players play. And I think most of us initially thought Trossard would be in the midfield, but it turned out that, in fact, he was playing more in the front line. But it was so fluid, and I think that was a, a big contribution to how we won the game. Yeah, I think we were all a little bit delighted to see that Trossard wasn't in the midfield when we saw the team line up because I think personally the Trossard midfield experience hasn't really worked. I don't think it worked in the reverse fixture against West Ham. Didn't think it was great at Brentford. I thought it was okay in some of the preseason games, but generally I'm more of a fan of Trossard in the final third where I think, especially against teams like West Ham where it's so tight and so compact, he's so good in tight spaces that he can make a real difference. But like you say, him and Havertz interchanged quite a lot and it gave the West Ham defenders, Zuma and, uh, and Aguerre, real problems because they didn't really know what they were supposed to be doing. They didn't know who they were supposed to be marking. Trossard was popping up even in the sixth position, even deeper than Declan Rice sometimes. And if you look at that ball for the second goal that's played through for Saka, it's Trossard who's the man picking him out and, and making that ball. And it was so fluid. Martinelli was going in the middle. Saka was going in the middle. Havertz was popping up there. Erdegaard was popping up there occasionally. And it made it really, really hard for, for West Ham to cope. And I think Arsenal especially given how many players they had out and, and how many players I'm sure Mikel Arteta would have liked to have played in this game. They really made the best of what they had um, tactically and they were, they were very impressive and the fluidity up front was a, a big, big part of that. So yeah, hats off to Arteta because he got his tactics spot on. And he did on the day. And he's, he's had to do that without so many key players, seven players out, a number of those starters, Thomas Partey, Yuri and Timber, Fabio Vieira, Smith-Rowe, Jesus, Zinchenko, Tommy Asu, of course, not available as well. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more in detail about where they're at in terms of their recoveries a little bit later on in the show. But it does, I think, maybe show that the depth that Arsenal have got in this team, that they're able to come away with such an emphatic win, is maybe actually better than people were giving it credit for, perhaps at the start of the season. Yeah, to be fair, I think up until Yuri and Timber got injured, I remember doing another podcast and talking about the squad depth and thinking, yeah, this is a really good squad. Um, mm. This is really deep. And Partey's been out most of the season. Timber's been out, obviously, most of the season. Fabio Vieira's been out most of the season. And when you consider those losses, Emil smith has always been out for long parts as well. Um, various other players have missed quite long parts. Um, Jesus has been out for, for quite a 
long period if you add up all the games he's missed. So Arsenal have been without really, really big players for quite long parts of the season. Zinchenko's been out. Tommy ashley has been out. All players who we think, you know, in an ideal world, Arsenal would like to keep really fit because they're really, really important players. And the fact they're able to cope and keep coming up with solutions and, and uh, resolving these problems and, and still putting up results that keep them up against, you know, two of the best teams, not just in Europe, but in probably European history in Man City and Liverpool. And they're able to sustain a run in the Champions League. I think maybe we've seen the limits of the squad when it comes to the domestic cuts where they've not done so well. And there are weak points in this Arsenal squad. And I've no doubt that between now and the end of the season, we'll be discussing where Arsenal need to strengthen and, and where they might need to, to add um, come the summer. But for now, they seem to be getting by. And you're right, the depth is, is, is pretty decent. Obviously, there are areas where they could get stronger. And I don't think any of us deny that. But mm. it's better than people give Arsenal credit for. And I think maybe just a bad run around Christmas got people a little bit more catastrophic than they needed to be. And now they're starting to see that, look, Arsenal squad players can do it. And, you know, Mikel Arteta's built a pretty decent squad over there. Absolutely. Um, returning more focus toward the game as well and, and the way in which it went down, there was, uh, of course, the first goal, which comes from a Declan Rice corner. And then the third goal is also from a Declan Rice delivery from a free kick. More set-piece goals in this Arsenal team. It seems like this is Nicholas Jova, of course, who uh, deserves plenty of credit for being the Arsenal set-piece coach, amongst other things, and his responsibilities as well. It It's almost as if like teams can't even prepare for this because it's not like it's a secret how good Arsenal are at set-pieces, and yet they just seem so consistent at them. Well, I think, to be fair, the consistency comes from a variety. So you see that set-piece that Arsenal tried where they whipped it to the back post. That was something they did really well against Crystal Palace, and the, both Gabriel goals came from a very similar tactic, but... They didn't do that against Liverpool, for example, and I don't think they did that against um, Nottingham Forest. I don't seem to remember them doing that. So, Jovo mixes it up depending on what he's expecting from the opposition and, and who they've got in the squad. And Arteta was quite interesting on that in the sense that he said in the post-match press conference that um, depending on who we've got in our team, this is him talking, um, then we'll mix it up. So, I think it's interesting. Um, the goals that Arsenal scored from set pieces, they've been worth... Uh, 1.7. I've got the stats in front of me, so I'm just reading them from a piece I did the other day. So I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna plug, plug my piece, which I went out on Tuesday morning, which um uh, yeah I really enjoyed writing, just looking into sort of how Arsenal have rediscovered their goal scoring touch and um the set piece goals they've scored have come from a value of 1.76 xg. So they've scored four uh goals from set pieces recently, four of their 16. So a quarter of their goals in this recent run have come from set pieces, and that's been a value of 1.76 xg. In those four games, they've created 11.76 xg so that's quite a significant amount of their expected goals coming from set pieces now it's even more impressive that when you consider arsenal have had 80 shots in that time so just from those four set pieces alone they've created 1.76 xg out of 80 shots so you know that shows how big and how good those chances are that they're creating from set pieces and it's really impressive it's really consistent and Mikel Arteta has spoken a lot about game state and how he wants to drive 100 mile an hour but often can't because there's so much traffic around Against teams like West Ham, they want to put up all the red lights. They want to, you know, provide you with roadblocks. They want to do roadworks. They want to put out 50 mile an hour zones, whatever they can do to slow you down. And when you've got set pieces, it's a shortcut. It's a way of going around those things. You use the hard shoulder, you go straight past it. It's fantastic. And I think Mikel Arteta will be really happy that once his team get in front and once those spaces start to come up, as we saw against West Ham, mm. Arsenal are really, really good at exploiting them. And they can be really, really, really efficient. Obviously, in games gone by, prior to the... Um, winter break, they weren't able to get in front. They weren't able to get that edge and then stay in front. You think back to, I don't know, even the game against Brighton where they were absolutely dominant for so much of the game. They only really won it in the last minute when uh, Kai Havertz scored a really late goal. So, yeah, I think it's really good for Arsenal that they're able to get these set pieces because they break games open in a way that maybe they've struggled to do in the first part of the season. So it's a real big improvement and something that's really, really important. And they're the best in the Premier League at it. Yeah, you alluded to the timing of those free kicks. The Crystal Palace one, of course, after uh, such a difficult run of games, we had to win that, that Crystal Palace game. Going to West Ham, having lost twice to them already this season, and of course the game in which we endured last year um, at the London Stadium in which Arsenal obviously dropped that two-goal lead to the pressure that was there's there evaporated so quickly with that that goal from from Saliba it quietened the crowd as well so significantly too and that then leads into another pressure moment where Bakaya Saka has to step up for the obvious narrative penalty uh, following of course his failure to to score the penalty at the London Stadium last season did you have any 
fears in that moment? Did you feel as though that someone else should have taken? It's easy to say the hindsight with him scoring, of course, that no, obviously it was the right choice. But was there anything that you thought, young guy, he's missed here before? Is it worth Odegaard taking it like he has in, in other games? I think big fears because with Saka in particular, the memory of the Euros final is never too far, up, far away. And uh, we all remember that penalty. We all remember what happened afterwards. And I don't think any of us want to see any of that happening again. So there's always a bit of a fear. And I think when you see a young guy, like you say, stepping up for that sort of situation, you start to think ordinarily that, you know, oh, maybe they shouldn't do it. Maybe they shouldn't go up again. But then you remember Bukayo Saka isn't an ordinary young guy. He is so much better than that, so much more consistent and so much more strong mentally. And I don't think there was any ever doubt, really, that he was going to take the penalty. I know Mikel Arteta said, that um, in the post-match press conference that he was unsure whether he'd take it. But Saka, for me, it's interesting that Arsenal normally do this thing where they they give the penalty ball to another player who sort of protects it and then they give it to someone else who's going to actually take the penalty. Um, this time around, Saka just had the ball in his hands the whole time. He wasn't messing around. He wasn't doing any games. He wasn't trying to play any mind games. West Ham was saying, no, sod this. I'm taking this and I'm going to make revenge for, for last year. And he looked really motivated. You spoke to him in the mix zone afterwards, Tom. I don't know if he said anything more specific on it, but um, he was he was clearly very fired up against West Ham because I think he had unfinished business, particularly at the London Stadium. So I'm glad for him that he was able to get that behind him. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I did speak to him uh, afterwards with uh, Simon from the Evening Standard was asking the questions kind of around the the penalty. Uh, he said, if you're going to be a penalty taker, I don't know any penalty taker that scores every single one. I'm not happy to miss, but I understand that it's part of the game. So when I won the penalty, I was ready to take it again and score as well. So it's that confidence, that self-belief that every top player wants uh, and needs to, to succeed at that level. And Saka's got it in an abundance. So it's, it was great to see him step up, take it so calmly and, and with such vigour as well. It was quite the hell of a a connection with the ball to smash it into the back of the net. Um, so, yeah, certainly excellent. And then, you know, at that point, you're 2 up. Yes, we then, as we've mentioned, get a three-goal lead through another set piece. Trossard, as we mentioned already as well, giving us that four-goal lead going into half time. And there's something to be said, I think, at time because sometimes Arsenal, if they have a significant lead, can sometimes just sit off and sit back. I remember the Lawns game in the Champions League. We took that big lead in at half time in the Champions League and can kind of like just controlled and, and saw that game out and made some changes. And we made some changes in this game, but there never seemed an intent of slacking off. They clearly wanted to get the fifth and then the sixth. And if we'd have got a seventh, we would have actually moved into second place in the table. And I wonder if that was was something that was mentioned actually at halftime about the goal difference. Because before this game, we were quite far behind Liverpool and Man City in terms of that goal difference, which we've closed significantly. Do you think that may have come into the thinking at halftime and, and the talking amongst the manager and the players? Possibly. I mean, Saka said that Arsenal smelt blood and I think it was quite clear that West Ham were, were there for the taking. They seemed to have surrendered. They seemed to have really given up and the fans obviously had given up, you know, half of them left at half time, and I don't blame them really. So, yeah, I think there was a, a real sense that Arsenal could have got as many goals as they wanted to. I think after the, the changes, things slowed down a bit and when Ethan Winery came on, he was very good. Um, but Rhys Nelson, Eddie and Ketia, those kind of guys, Moel Nenny, Cedric, kind of slowed it down a bit in terms of the intent to go forward. And I think people maybe declared a bit to use sort of the cricketing analogy to say, look, six nil is good. We'll we'll take it, we'll take it there. But I think um it's interesting. I remember one instance in the, the second half where the ball was sort of going out of play and, and no one was really going to try and challenge for it. Makaya Saka with Arsenal, I think five nil up at this point, and he's just scored his second goal, absolutely sprinting as hard as he could to, to go and keep it in play. And that eventually mm. leads to the move that that sets up Declan Rice's goal. So this is the intensity that I think you need. And I think if you want to win Premier Leagues against Manchester City and Liverpool, it can't just be a desire to win. It has to be an obsession. It has to be something that you really, really think about 24-7. You never let up. And I think for Arsenal, that's really, really important because maybe up against these relentless winners that Arsenal are up against, Man City, Liverpool, they've not had the same experience of doing that. That consistency of going on a big, big run, 10, 11, 13 games in a row. Arsenal have never really done that. And if you're going to do that, you can't really let standards slip at any point. You can't, you know, allow it to dip. So I think Mikel Arteta will be really happy with the mentality he saw from his players in the second half. But also, most importantly, I think the Arsenal players seem to be getting it in terms of what it takes to, to win a league. And that can only be a good thing going forward. Yeah, absolutely. We want them to be, you know, free-flowing and, and free-scoring. And Thierry Henry spoke, obviously, about the, the striker debate and the fact that, you know, if Arsenal take their chances, they we don't need to have this conversation about a 30-goal a season striker because they can win games at a canter. That's, what, 16 goals in their last four games? Um, 
it is an incredible kind of potential that this team has got to score goals. And last season, without that 30 goal a season striker and without Gabriel Jesus uh, for available for a third of the campaign, Arsenal scored more Premier League goals than they've ever got before in a season, more than with Van Persie or with Henri or with Bergkamp or Anelka or Abamyang, you know. So, and then obviously this season, at the same stage as it was last year, we're one goal ahead and we've conceded one goal less as well. Yes, we're five points fewer than we were at this stage last season, but goal-wise, both scoring and conceding, we're tracking ever so slightly better, um, which certainly bodes well going into this run of fixtures, which at the moment is leading up to that inevitable clash at the Etihad as well. But I think we will probably be in a position where Arteta will be in a position where do you think he still wants to keep this very much taking it one game at a time? Yeah, probably. The The goal scoring stuff is really interesting because um, I don't know about you, but on Sunday, Arsenal still looked like a team that could do with a 25-goal-a-season striker. <laughs> yeah. It's weird to say for a team that won 6-0, but they, they missed chances. They missed a lot of good chances. Yeah. They dropped one header in the first half. There was a Saka header as well. Yeah. The volley as well. That's, uh, the volley that, to be yeah. fair, that was a fantastic save from Mariola. Yeah. But I'm, I'm also thinking of the, the cross that Martinelli puts in that sort of goes in between Saka and Erdegaard. And mm. those are the kind of ones that a proper centre-forward would be taking. And if Arsenal were to add it, it would be a bonus. But like you yeah. say... And like Thierry Henry said the other night, I don't think it's a necessity. And, and people forget that Manchester City won the league for three years in a row without having Erling Haaland. I know Aguero was there, but he wasn't key. He wasn't yeah. their main man. They won it with players scoring, lots of players, admittedly, scoring 15, 16 goals a season. And that's doable. That can be done. If you share the goals around it, it's possible. And there's not that many number nines out there who will come in and score 50-odd goals like Erling Haaland did. If Arsenal can get one, fantastic. And I don't think Nicola Teta is going to say... Nah, there's no manager in the world who would say, I don't want a 50 goal a season striker. But at the same time, until they get one or until they find one, they kind of have to make do with what they've got. And I think Arsenal have become really good at sort of managing that and, and, and earning the most they can out of their players. I think Arteta has, has really maximised what he can get out of this squad. And yeah, before the winter break, some of their numbers were quite disappointing. You look at the goals that Saka, Martinelli, Jesus etc were scoring in the league I think the highest scorer was Saka with six and, and, and mm. two or three of those were penalties so now he started to add more to his game they've all started to add more to their game and, and suddenly also look a real threat in front of the goal so I think it's maybe a lesson to be learned that just because it's a January transfer window doesn't mean that Arsenal fans or any group of fans to be fair in particular or any analysis of the team has to be so narrow-minded that you think one strike will come in it will fix it all I saw a lot of pieces around January window saying, if Arsenal can sign Ivan Tony, problem solved. It wouldn't mm. have been that simple. It was never going to be that simple. And Arsenal do create lots of chances. Like Thierry Henry said, they just need to put them away. And obviously a 25 goal a season strike would be fantastic. But I think they're doing okay for now. Mm. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Sorry, go on. No, no, no. That was it. That was the end of the answer. I just think that the names that obviously talked about, Arsenal aren't going to find Erling Haaland in the summer. You know, the Erling Haaland stands in a bracket of his own with probably Kylian Mbappe, who again, I don't think is going to be accessible to Arsenal in the summer, despite being perhaps on the move. Um, There's an exclusive transfer line. <laughs> Mbappe not going to Arsenal at the moment. <laughs> yeah, it's a breaking, breaking story, groundbreaking stuff. Um, but... Uh, there is scope, obviously, to, to strengthen there. And I think there is a willingness as well, you know, from Arsenal to want to strengthen that position. And I think the fact that Kai Havertz has come into the team and Trossard has come into the team over a player like Eddie Nketiah, for instance, is, is perhaps a big signal that they see a future where Eddie will probably move on and Arsenal will eventually see Jesus perhaps not step down the pecking order as such, but probably be in a rotational position with another centre forward that we have and Jesus can then cover other positions on the field in, in wide areas as he gets to a more mature age. So there, there's so much versatility in what Arteta likes and the players that he signs that it creates opportunities and avenues, I think, for any player that, that does eventually arrive at the club. And so, of course, despite the fact it was a brilliant win, the frustration at the weekend, obviously, was the fact that Man City still won and Liverpool still won and Spurs somehow still managed to win uh, right at the end as well, which is obviously what I think Arsenal fans have got to expect is that this, if you are to win the title, as Manchester City did last season, when I remember both of us on the train back from Villa Park celebrating the fact they dropped points at, at Forest and then they didn't drop points again in the season until they won the title, is that if Arsenal are to win a league title this year, which is going to be very difficult, far more difficult than last season because they had another team involved in the race, not just City, they're probably going to have to win 
the rest of the games, if not maybe a couple, especially at the Etihad, you'd have to think. Yeah, there is a somewhat depressing reality for Arsenal that they could win every single game between now and the end of the season and still not be Premier League champions. Mm. But that is just the reality of the Premier League these days. That is the reality of Manchester City. That is the reality of Liverpool. These are teams that consistently have got above 90 points. Liverpool have consistently got above 90 points and not won Premier League titles. Arsenal could fall into that bracket. Obviously, they don't want to think like that. They don't want to think negatively. But I think that frustration at not seeing Liverpool or City drop points is something Arsenal are going to have to get used to. And they're going to have to bide their time. They're going to have to not slip up and drop City points like they did around the festive period against West Ham and Fulham. And if, if they can keep themselves there, they've got games, like you say, against Man City. Liverpool and City do play each other. So there are some points where potentially ground could be gained and Arsenal just need to make sure that they're in the fight. That's all they can do for now. They are the chasers rather than the team being chasers like last season. And I think that makes a big difference for them in terms of what they're able to do. Um, and maybe the mentality that they have, the relentlessness that they have. It's interesting also, I think, going forward that Liverpool are obviously generally going to be playing last because they'll be in the Europa League and Arsenal and City will be in the Champions League. So that's going to make things different for them. And I think maybe last season, Arsenal struggled a little bit having the pressure of knowing, right, we need to win this or we need to get a point here. And that, I think, told towards the end of the season when they got those three draws in a row. They they lost points to West uh, to Southampton and Nottingham Forest and, and plenty of others. So I think that's going to be big for Arsenal. I think it's really important that they can get a bit of an advantage. They can get their points on the board and then, and then go from there. But like you say, all they can do is focus on Arsenal because City and Liverpool are probably going to win most of their games. Mm, they are indeed, yeah. Um, Burnley is next, of course. Um, and Arsenal could have, um, you know, we're looking at potentially who could be back. Uh, I know you've done a couple of stories on some of the players. The player that is most likely to be back, we think, is, is perhaps Takira Tomiyasu, um, of course, who's returned from the Asia Cup. Wasn't available for the game this week and Arsenal being cautious, I think, uh, around his... So, because he only just came back from injury where, before then going off to play for Japan in the Asia Cup. So that was a frustration to then see him play so many games in quick succession after recovery. Covering. But yeah, give us an update on on him and then and then anyone else that we've seen reports of because I know you've covered Fabio Vieira today as well. Yeah, so it was it was a niggle for for Tommy Asset. It was the same calf that uh, he had injured uh, before going off to to the Asian Cup, like you say in that game uh, just prior to Luton. I think it was Wolves, and um, I think Arsenal didn't want to take any risks. And with Jakub Kivio available, they thought you know what we'll be all right. Um, and so they they went for it. Um, I think it was bold for them not to include Tommy Asi, given that uh, Zinchenko was out, but they sort of prioritised sorry, long term over short term for that game and, and they, they got away with it. The hope is that Tommy Asi should be involved against Burnley. Uh, it's it's less certain that Zinchenko will be back. Same with Gabriel Jesus. Obviously, Zinchenko struggling with a calf problem of his own that he's been dealing with for most of the season, kept him out around the new year, missed the start of the season with that calf problem as well and yeah, came off at half-time against Liverpool and be a real blow for Arsenal to be with that Zinchenko, um, particularly because Burnley are a team that leaves so many open spaces and Zinchenko is the kind of guy who can really tear those apart. Uh, Gabriel Jesus is the knee problem, still going. Um, yeah, if Arsenal seems to be getting all right, getting on all right without him in terms of goal scoring and, and front forward play. So maybe they won't miss him too much, but they won't want him out for too much longer. And the the things I've heard is that he's a, he's a big doubt for for Burnley, uh, same goes for Partey, who obviously is still recovering from his latest setback. Um, uh, we reported on FL that he's not, it's not as serious as, as maybe some of the previous setbacks have been, but it's still not great. And they're hoping to be back sooner rather than later. Um, Smith Rowe's ankle injury. Again, this is all in the injury piece. So if you want more in depth, go in and, and read that. But um, that's not thought to be too serious. He, he rolled his ankle in training, very unlucky in the build up towards this uh, West Ham game. Because you think that 6 0, if he'd come on, I feel like he would have been amongst the goals and he would have really enjoyed himself because that feels mm. like the perfect game for him. But unfortunately, yeah, not available. Um, Jorginho has got that foot injury that is still being monitored. Um, so I think Arsenal are aware of the amount of uh, minutes they can use him for. I'm trying to think. There's so many injuries at the minute. It's hard to keep up. Uh, obviously, yes, yes, we said Fabio Vieira, hopefully back before the end of this month in training. So we don't know whether he'll be back for Champions League games. Uh, I don't know if he'll be back ready for Porto the away leg, maybe you can look at the return leg because obviously that's his old club. He'll want to to get out against them. And, and Urien Timber is slowly progressing out on the grass, doing bits and bobs, not back in full training yet though. So I'm a little way off for him. Um, I'm trying to think, has anyone rem I've not remembered? But so. yeah. Seven, right? Gabriel Jesus yeah. and Zinchenko, you mentioned them. Yeah. 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 I mean, the general point is, I think, is that Arsenal are managing a hell of a lot of injuries right now. And mm. um, 
Mikel Arteta has spoken several times about the importance of having 25 fit players going into the run-in and, and they've not had that in previous years. And they'll be hopeful that having had such bad luck for most of the season with injuries, they can get a little bit of fortune going into the, the final few games of the season because that's going to be massive. Going to the Etihad with a fully fit squad would be huge if Arsenal can, can pull it off. And yeah, fingers crossed they can. Indeed. Um, and it is Burnley, of course, that they face. They won't have Vincent Kompany uh, on the touchline because he has uh, he's serving a one-match ban from his uh, three yellow cards uh, that he's picked up, the last one against Liverpool, um, ironically. So I don't know how much of a difference that will make. I mean, we saw it make a difference for Arsenal when they went to Villa, I think. Not having Arteta on the touchline mattered in that game. And Burnley have... An, a strange side that, you know, when they came up from the Championship, they were seen as kind of this side that were different under company, playing some really good football. They weren't the Sean Dyche side anymore. But that's almost counted against them in so many ways this season because they seem you know more open than they did under Dyche. You think, and you look at this game, touch wood, as, as it should really be a W on the list for the Gunners. Yeah, I think the word I've used to describe early this season is naive. Um, they've come up, obviously, with lovely ideals of how they want to play football and how they don't want to change their game for the opposition. But also, you have to change your game for the opposition if, if you're Burnley. No disrespect to Burnley, but you can't be coming up against teams like Man City, Liverpool, Arsenal, whoever, and expecting that you'll be able to play them off the park because the players just aren't as good. That's just the reality of the situation. And yeah, it sucks for them. Um, I think they're in big trouble. I think they're going down. And I think Arsenal need to get three points. And if they don't get three points, it'll be a really, really bad result for Arsenal because this is a very, very winnable game. Going to Turf more is not like it used to be. It's not as difficult as it used to be. And yeah, Arsenal need those points. Yeah, the most difficult thing about that trip is for the people that have to make it uh, from London, to be fair. <laughs> is, it is a right pain getting out to Burnley for fans and journalists alike. So uh, good luck to those making the trip. What do you make of Liverpool and Man City's fixtures? Of course, Liverpool are away at Brentford's and Manchester City are at home to a reinvigorated Chelsea side. <laughs> reinvigorated is generous. I watched their game on Monday night and... Yes, they got those late goals and, and yes, they came back to win against Palace, but um, it's not a good Palace side at the minute and Chelsea probably should have been able to, to win more comfortably. And uh, But having said that, you know, Pochettino, I think, is a good manager and they gave a really good, they gave it a really good go against City at the, in the home game. It was the 4 all. I'd yeah. love for another result like that. I think our, all, all people associated with Arsenal would love for another result like that, but we'll have to see. Um, Brentford away is a really tough game. They've beaten Liverpool. They've got points against Liverpool in the past and um, as we know from Arsenal, you know, it's, it's not an easy place to go. I know Arsenal have had a good record in their past two games in terms of winning, but they left it to the last minute in this season's fixture and obviously lost them on that opening day and that COVID-affected opening day all those years ago. So it's not an easy game, but at the same time, Arsenal can't worry about that. All they can do is focus on, on winning their games and hopefully, you know, if they get a few players, if they get a, a nice early result, uh, they can start resting a few players for, for Porto as well because that's going to be a big game in the Champions League as well. Yeah, massive game. Uh, really, really big game in the Champions League. Arsenal have to look at, at progressing past the last 16 for the first time in more than a decade. Uh, the last time Arsenal reached it was, I think, 2010 um, was the last time Arsenal were in the beyond the last 16 of the Champions League. And, and Porto, despite being a very good side, and of course, got, you know, really gave uh, Barcelona a, a good run for their money in their group stage games. Arsenal should be progressing past and anything other than a progression would be seen as a huge disappointment for Arsenal and an opportunity in the Champions League this season. Of course, Liverpool not involved in it. Bayern Munich facing some questions after they, of course, were beaten by Bayer Leverkusen handily um, over the previous weekend. And Real Madrid and Man City being the, the two main targets uh, that you'd see for Arsenal in terms of that that competition so there's there's opportunities uh, any final thoughts Kai before we wrap up any pieces that people should be aware of um we've got a, uh, a little transfer line coming out this afternoon so keep an eye out on that um obviously the injury updates have all been registered uh, I'll be looking at a few things but Arsenal need to strengthen the forward line but yeah the transfer line is the one I'd, I'd keep an eye out on I wouldn't want to give it fully away just yet but yeah keep an eye out for it hopefully coming very soon Indeed. Uh, you can check out my piece on Kai Havertz. You've probably seen some rumours doing the round about him and certainly they get quashed uh, in this piece. So have a look at that. Uh, and there's a piece that went out yesterday on um, the latest undroppable, a big piece about Mika, uh, about Martin Odegaard and his presence in this Arsenal team at the moment. First player to reach 50 chances created in the top five leagues across Europe uh, after his game against West Ham. I think also the other stat was He's the only player since 03-04 to make 100-plus passes, assist multiple uh, 
um, players in the game and create five plus opportunities. So quite the stat, quite the game he had, despite not scoring. And I think that goal scoring thing is something that you know has, has, has come into the the, the fore with Erdegaard this season. But he's certainly still delivering uh, elsewhere on the field. Um, but thank you so much for listening. Uh, you can follow Kai on Twitter at Kai Karnak ninety seven. You can follow myself at Tom Cantor Media and all of our written work, as we say over at Football London. You'll be able to get uh, the match blog on the weekend when we face Burnley, of course. Uh, and of course, we'll have plenty of build up to that with the press conference and, of course, all the reaction from the game, too. We'll see you next week. Hopefully, just check in the rotor quickly uh, whilst we're live. If we're both around on Monday, uh, we're not. It's going to be another delayed one, sadly. Um, but uh, we'll find out when next we'll bring you the show. But we'll endeavor to bring you one next week. It may come after the game against Porto, um, but uh, we'll try to get you a show, at least something out next week as well. Thank you for listening. Stay safe, stay well. And as always, keep following us down. The Arsenal way.